We're going to start off the day doing a quick multiple choice question, everyone. Multiple choice question number 14. It's on page 14 or 15 of your worksheet book. Have a look at it, and please submit the answer to this multiple choice question as multiple choice number one on your submission form. All right, let's take a look at this one now that you've had a chance to do it. We've got 22 people responding here. We have a grand total of 55% of you choosing D, 23% of you chose B, 18% uh, of you chose A, and 5% of you said, I don't know, chose E, option E. So let's take a look at this. Clearly, it's, uh, it's a question that gave us a little bit of problem. It's a good question. Uh, two boys, Ted and Larry, initially at rest push each other apart on a frictionless surface. As soon as I see that, I think conservational momentum because we're dealing with what amounts to an explosion, right? We start off with basically one object, Ted and Larry combined. They split apart. Ted goes one way, Larry goes the other way. Ted has a mass of 40 kilograms. Larry has a mass of 60 kilograms. After the boys push each other apart, Ted has a speed of 6 meters per second. Larry has more... Oh, we're just, you know what, I read that question, I'm thinking they're going to ask me for Larry's speed. That would be a straight conservation momentum problem, right? But they don't ask me for Larry's speed, they ask me for Larry's momentum and, uh, and or kinetic energy. Um, let's write down some givens here. Okay, let's call Ted object number one and Larry object number two. They're both at rest, so the initial velocity of the system, Ted and Larry combined, is going to be zero meters per second. Ted has a mass of 40 kilograms. That's going to be M1. Larry is 60 kilograms, M2. Uh, after the boys push each other apart, Ted has a speed of 6. What's that going to be, guys? V what? V1 or V2? V1, V1 what? V1F. V1F. Uh, 6 meters per second. And we don't know how fast Larry is moving. We're going to need to know that. Um, my guess is probably yes. Okay, as soon as I looked at that question, I, I guessed that it was going to be conservation of momentum. And I'm probably going to end up using conservation momentum to find Larry's velocity. Even though that's not what the question is asking, in all likelihood, I'm still going to need to do that. All right. What does Larry have? More momentum, less momentum than Ted, or none of the above? Let's forget about C and D for a second. Let's just look at momentum. Do we know, the, do we know which one of A or B, if any, is correct just by looking at the question? Or do we have to do a calculation here? What do we know about the momentum of Larry and Ted? Well, you know that it's taking because um, Larry weighs more. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. But it can't be what? It can't be Okay. So it can't be B then, right? Good. Um, we know that the velocity of Larry is going to be less because we know that the momentum is going to be the same. If we had zero momentum when we started off here, which is exactly what we had, right? If we say PI is equal to PF, we had zero momentum when we started here, when these two guys were just standing there. We have to have zero momentum after. Well, if Ted has a, a momentum of 16 to the right, then Larry has to have a momentum of negative 16 or 16 to the left. So we know we're going to have the same momentum. Now, that means that Ted, because he's heavier, is going to have a smaller velocity. Now, does that mean he has more kinetic energy than Ted or less kinetic energy than Ted? Well, it depends upon how much smaller his velocity is, right? So I think what we're going to need to do here is find his speed and find the kinetic energy in, of both of them and then compare their kinetic energies. So let's do that. Let's do conservation momentum first. Uh, zero initial momentum equals M1V1F plus M2V2F. We've got 40 kilograms times V1F is 6 meters per second plus 60 kilograms uh, times V2F. I think V2F is going to work out to be, I believe, 4, negative 4 meters per second. All right, I still don't have my answer, but now at least I can find the kinetic energy of Ted and the kinetic energy of Larry. Ted is uh, 40 uh, and his speed is 6. Okay, one, uh, 6 squared is 36, times 20 is 7,200. Of Larry, it's going to be one half of mv squared as well, but mass is going to be 60, and v is going to be 4. Okay, 4 squared is 16, 16 times 30 is 4,800, is that right? 4,800? Okay, so what do you know now? Does Larry have more kinetic energy than Ted or less kinetic energy than Ted? 
less kinetic energy than 10. So the answer is D. So uh, although it was an overwhelming majority of you, uh, the majority of you still got the right answer for this. Did anybody do this question without actually calculating the speed? I mean, legitimately do this question, not just guessing, but legitimately do this question, because there is a way of kind of reasoning through it. It's just a little bit harder to spot. Paige, what did you do? Yeah. Right, right. Okay, okay. Now, yeah, you, you're certainly on the right track there. Uh, in the end, because kinetic energy is one half mv squared, tell me what matters for kinetic energy more, mass or speed? Speed matters more, right? So if the speed is less and the mass is more, that's still going to give me a lower kinetic energy. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Good logic there. Yep. You can, you, you can if you can reason through it like Paige did there. Okay? But in the end, uh, probably most people didn't think of that. Okay? Most people didn't think of that. Most people are probably like, uh, i got to find the kinetic energy. If I want to compare the kinetic energies, I've got to find the values. You didn't actually have to find the values, um, but most people probably did. Well, you got to be careful there. You say, you and Paige both said... Um, the answer is D because the speed is lower. And you would recognize that the speed is lower, right? Because the momentum's got to be the same. And that's good logic. Okay, but why does the lower speed give me a lower kinetic energy? Because the mass is higher, right? Just because it's got a lower speed, why does it have why does it have lower kinetic energy? Well, because it's a lower speed, right? But but if mass is higher, that gives me more kinetic energy. But the speed matters more because it's squared. Okay, so if you recognize um, that although mass is higher, speed is lower, and speed matters more because it's squared, then yes, that's fine. That's good logic. Okay, if you just kind of said, oh, speed is lower, and you kind of stopped there and said, okay, then therefore kinetic energy is lower, then you got a little bit lucky on it because mass is higher. And in some other equation, maybe if you had m squared, I mean, that's not an equation, right? But if there was an equation with m squared v, then, uh, then you would have got the wrong answer there because mass would have mattered more. Now, obviously, with kinetic energy, it's always going to be mv squared, one half mv squared. But some other equation, completely different, where you have to go through the same process. That's what I'm talking about, where the other variable is squared. Okay, we good there? All right. I want to move on to one small new topic today. Uh, today, we're going to distinguish between the types of collisions. Uh, up until this point, we've just dealt with collisions in general and for every one of those collisions we found that momentum was stayed the same it still does that doesn't change the way that we've analyzed the problems up until this point will remain the same forever and ever and ever all throughout physics 30 and even if you go on and take courses in university nothing that we've done so far has changed but now we're going to go a step further and distinguish between two types of collisions that we have the two types of collisions that we have are called elastic and inelastic collisions. An elastic collision is a collision in which momentum is conserved. Well, so is an inelastic collision. Momentum is always conserved, right? That hasn't changed. But an elastic collision also has kinetic energy conserved. In other words, momentum stays the same in an isolated system, and kinetic energy stays the same in an isolated system. In an inelastic collision, momentum will still stay the same because it always does. But kinetic energy won't stay the same. Kinetic energy will decrease. You'll lose kinetic energy. So what kind of collisions exactly do produce elastic collisions? What kind of interactions do we have that are elastic? And what kind of interactions that we have that are inelastic. Well, generally speaking, most collisions are inelastic. Most collisions will have momentum conserved. In fact, all collisions will have momentum conserved, but most collisions will have kinetic energy lost. Okay, most collisions, you will have more kinetic energy before the collision than you do after the collision. Here's why. You guys learned about this in uh, Science 10, the second law of thermodynamics. Whenever you have a conversion of energy taking place, you always lose a little bit. You guys remember that? 
Whenever an energy conversion takes place, you always lose a little bit. Well, when two things hit each other, there's usually an energy conversion taking place. Okay, a basketball hits the floor. Okay, there's an energy conversion taking place. I'm not talking about the potential energy converted to kinetic as it falls. That's not the collision. I'm talking about the kinetic energy of the ball converted to elastic potential energy as the ball compresses when it hits the floor. Okay, when two objects, when two cars collide, they dent. There's a conversion of energy from kinetic energy to elastic potential energy, to sound energy, to heat energy. There's always a conversion of energy taking place there. Almost always a conversion of energy taking place. Now, whenever we have that conversion, we lose a little bit. So even after they bounce apart, we must have less kinetic energy than we started with because we lost a little bit in the process of converting that. Does that make sense? Bounce that basketball, you got a certain amount of kinetic energy just before the ball hits the ground. It gets converted completely to elastic potential as the ball gets squished against the ground. Then it gets converted back to kinetic energy as it starts going back up into the air again. But there was a conversion of energy taking place there from kinetic to potential back to kinetic again, which caused you to lose a little bit of energy, which caused the final kinetic energy to be a little bit less than the initial. That's why almost every collision is inelastic. Now, when can we have a truly elastic collision? If every time we have an energy conversion taking place, it's inelastic, and when things hit each other, it's usually kinetic converted to potential converted back to kinetic, when can we have elastic? When can we not lose kinetic energy? Basketball? No. Sorry? No, no, not a bouncing ball, because they still compress, right? Still conversion taking place. The only truly elastic collisions, the only really, truly 100% elastic collisions actually involve subatomic particles. And the reason that those are elastic is because when they hit each other, when the smallest possible particles hit each other, they can't compress. They can't squish like a basketball because they're already as small as they get, right? So that's when we have an elastic collision. Now, when in everyday life do we have what approximates an elastic collision? Something like two marbles hit each other or two billiard balls hit each other. Why would that be pretty darn close to elastic? Because they don't squish very much, right? When two billiard balls hit each other, they don't compress. Not very much. They do a little bit, but not very much. So because they don't compress very much, bless you, then we're not going to see a huge conversion of kinetic to potential back to kinetic. It's going to be kinetic, and it remains kinetic energy. Does that make sense? Now, here's a rule of thumb. Okay, sometimes we can, look, we can know if something's kinet, uh, elastic or not just by looking at the situation. Sometimes we can't. If the two objects stick together, it must be inelastic. Okay, if they stick together, you will lose kinetic energy. It will be inelastic. If they bounce apart, if they bounce apart, well, it could be elastic, or it still could be inelastic. We don't know. Okay, all bets are off. So if you see a problem where they stick together, you don't even need to do a calculation. You know that it's going to be inelastic. If you see a problem where they bounce apart, you have to do a calculation to determine whether kinetic energy is lost or whether kinetic energy stays the same. Now remember, in both cases, momentum stays the same. But in one of those cases, kinetic energy is lost. Here's a little summary table. In an elastic collision, is momentum conserved? Yes. In an inelastic collision, is momentum conserved? Yes. Is kinetic energy conserved in an elastic collision? Yes. Is kinetic energy conserved in an inelastic collision? No. Kinetic energy is lost. Do the objects bounce apart in an elastic collision? Yes. They always do in an elastic collision. Do the objects bounce apart in an inelastic collision? Sometimes. If they stick together, it's got to be inelastic. But if they bounce apart, it could be either one. It could be elastic or inelastic. So, 
Do they bounce apart in an inelastic collision? Well, sometimes they stick together, sometimes they bounce apart. That's when we're going to do our calculation. Let's do one example that puts this into play here. Okay, it says 9.9 uh, .9 on 482. It says a 0 0.160 kilogram billiard ball traveling at 0.5 meters per second strikes a stationary snooker ball, rebounds at 0 0.230. The snooker ball moves off at 0.465. Is it inelastic or elastic? They bounce apart. Can I determine right away by looking at the question whether it's elastic or not? No. If they stuck together, would I have to do a calculation here? No, if they stuck together, I could just say right away, it's inelastic. I know that kinetic energy will be lost because they've stuck together. Okay, I can't do that here. Okay, I'm going to label the 0.16 kilogram object as M1. The other one, therefore, is going to be M2. This is going to be V1 initial. Okay, uh, the other one is going to be V2 initial, and it's going to be zero meters per second. Okay, the billiard ball, that's going to be V2. Uh, sorry, V1 final, V1 final is 0 0.20230, but it's south, so it's a negative velocity. And then the snooker ball, that's going to be V2F. I have all the variables here. And we look at this and say, oh, it's a conservation momentum problem because it's a collision. Well, it is, but you have everything. So you don't need to actually use conservation momentum here. I want to determine whether it's elastic or not. Let's calculate the kinetic energy, EKI. It's 1 half m1 v1 i squared plus 1 half m2 v2 i squared. This, I just cross off. How come? Because it's 0, right? v2 i is 0. The snooker ball is at rest. OK, we say 1 half of 0 0.160 kilograms times v1 i of 0 0.500. Okay, that's going to give me the total initial kinetic energy. It gives me 0 0.0200 joules. That's my initial kinetic energy. Now let's find my final kinetic energy. It's going to be 1 half of M1V1F squared plus 1 half of M2V2F squared. Put 160. Uh, the final... The final speed of object number one is 0 0.0230. Square that. Plus one half of 0 0.180 times the final speed there of 0.465. And then we can't forget to square that. If I made a mistake in here, where? Negative velocity. Is that a mistake? No, it's not a mistake. It's not a mistake. Okay, I circled that as a south to remind me that it's a negative if I, if I need to use that. right? But I don't need to use the final velocity of object number one. I'm using the final speed of object number one. So when I put it into here, I'm not putting it in as a negative number because I'm putting in speed, not velocity. Okay, So in the end, if I had to miss the fact that that was to the south, that's OK. I would have gotten away with it in this case. right? Not in a conservation momentum problem, because momentum is a vector. But kinetic energy is a scalar, so I don't pay any attention to the direction. Even if it was at some funny angle, 36 degrees north of west, doesn't matter. We'd ignore the direction. Okay, let's calculate that number now. Oh, when we do that, look at that. We get 0 0.0195. Oh, what a great question. 0 0.0195. Joules. Is that elastic or inelastic? Boy, those numbers are really close to the same, aren't they? If we round them to one digit, in fact, then what are we going to get? 0 0.02 and 0 0.02. So is it elastic or not? How many digits should we round our final answer to here? Three. To three digits, are they the same number? No. Then what is it, Liam? Elastic or inelastic? Inelastic. Okay, if this was to one digit, if there was something up here that told me to round everything to one digit, then we would call this an elastic collision. But since we know it to a precision of three digits, okay, we know that it's not actually elastic, it's inelastic. Now, it's real close. It's about as close as you're ever going to get, probably, to an elastic collision, but it's still not elastic. We're going to say this is inelastic. 
Make sense? All right. Here's your work that you have to do uh, now for the next six minutes and over the break. Besides your lab that's due on the Monday after the break, uh, you have uh, the practice problems on 482. There's two of them. Okay, so do these for Monday after the break. In addition, some check and reflect questions. Page 486, number 1 to 11. You should be able to get those questions on 482 done today in class. So that leaves you only with page 486, number 1 to 11. And then, of course, your lab that's due uh, on the first day after the break as well. All right. That's it.